Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Suzette H. Solis, and I will be discussing to you the head and neck um, section. So many critical structures like the sensory organs, cranial nerves, and major blood vessels originate in the head and neck. So it is very important to us uh, to be able to study on this part and integrate it in our um, history and PE. So the common health history um, in, in concerning head and neck, we have our common or concerning symptoms such as headache, change in vision, blurred vision, loss of vision, floaters, flashing lights, eye pain, redness, or tearing, double vision or diplopia, hearing loss, earache, ringing in the ears, tinnitus, dizziness and vertigo, nosebleed or epistaxis, sore throat, hoarseness, swollen glands, and goiter. So the head health history. Headache is one of the most common symptoms in clinical practice with a lifetime prevalence of 30% in the general population. Among types of headaches, tension headache predominates, affecting half of all individuals during their lifetime. Headaches are generally classified as primary without an identified underlying disease or secondary with an identified underlying disease. However, every headache warrants careful evaluation for life-threatening secondary causes such as meningitis, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or mass lesion. So we must elicit a full description of every headache and its seven attributes. Is it unilateral or bilateral, severe with sudden onset like a thunderclap, steady or throbbing, continuous or intermittent? Is there an aura? Is the headache typical or is there something different? And look for important signs or red flags that warn of headaches needing prompt consideration. Headache warning signs for immediate investigation include progressively frequent or severe over a three-month period, sudden onset like a thunderclap or the worst headache of my life, new onset after age 50 years, aggravated or relieved by change in position, precipitated by balsalva maneuver, associated symptoms of fever, night sweats, or weight loss, presence of cancer, HIV infection or pregnancy, change in pattern from past headaches, lack of similar headache in the past, recent head trauma and associated papilledema, neck stiffness or focal neurologic deficits. So our techniques of examination includes starting in the hair. Note its quantity, distribution, texture, and any pattern of flaws you may see loose flakes of dandruff. The scalp, part the hair in several places and look for scaliness, lumps, nevi, or other lesions. The skull, observe the general size and contour of the skull. Note any deformities, depressions, lumps, or tenderness. Learn to recognize the irregularities in normal skull, such as those near the suture lines between the parietal and occipital bones. You have to review your anatomy from your first year subject. So the face, note the patient's facial expression and contours, observe for asymmetry, involuntary movements, edema, and masses. The skin, observe the skin on the face and head, noting its color, pigmentation, texture, thickness, hair distribution, and any lesions. So you have previously discussed the skin section. You have to include what you have learned here in the techniques of examination of your of the skin of the face. For the eyes, in the health history, we must ask, how is your vision? If the patient reports a change in vision, pursue the related details. Is the problem worse during close work or at a distance? Is the onset sudden or gradual? Is there blurring of the entire field of vision or only parts? Is blurring central? peripheral, or only on one side? Has the patient seen lights flashing across the field of vision? Vitreous floaters, maybe? 
Ask about pain in or around the eyes, redness and excessive tearing and watering, and also check for diplopia or double vision. In the techniques of examination of the eye, we have important areas for examination. We have six, the visual acuity, visual fields, conjunctiva and sclerae, corneal lens and pupils, extraocular movements, which is really needed for we can check our cranial nerves there, and the funda, including the optic disc and cap, retina, and retinal vessels. In testing for the visual acuity, to test the acuity of central vision, use a well-lit Snellen eye chart. If possible, no? have, you been, have you seen a Snellen chart? I think so. Then position the patient 20 feet from the chart. Patients who wear glasses other than for reading should put them on. Ask the patient to cover one eye with a card to prevent looking through the fingers and to read the smallest line of print possible. Coaxing to attempt the next line may improve performance. A patient who cannot read the largest letter should be positioned closer to the chart. Note the intervening distance. Identify the smallest line of print where the patient can identify more than half the letters. Record the visual acuity designated at the side of each line, along with use of glasses if any. Visual acuity is expressed as two numbers, example, 20 over 30. The first indicates the distance of the patient from the chart, and the second, the distance at which a normal eye can read the line of letters. So usual, the normal is a 20-20 vision. Testing near with a handheld card can help identify the need for reading classes or bifocals. In patients older than 45 years, you can also use this card to test visual acuity at the bedside. So for us in physical diagnosis, merong benta niyan yung 14 yung yung card lang na we can use with a distance of 14 inches from the patient's eye. What that is what we are doing before when we were still students. So this card simulates a Snellen chart. So visual fields by confrontation, it is a valuable screening technique for detection of lesions in, in the anterior and posterior visual pathway. So we have the static finger wiggle test, as you can see in the picture. Position yourself about an arm's length away from the patient. Close one eye and have the patient cover the opposite eye while staring at your open eye. So for example, when the patient covers the left eye to test the visual field of the patient's right eye, you should cover your right eye to mimic the patient's field of view. Place your hands about two feet apart out of the patient's view, roughly lateral to the patient's ears. Using the kinetic red target test, facing the patient, Move a 5 millimeter red top pin inward from beyond the boundary of each quadrant along a line bisecting the horizontal and vertical meridians. Ask the patient when the pin first appears to be red. Position and alignment of the eyes. Stand in front of the patient and survey the eyes for position and alignment. If one or both eyes seem to protrude, assess them from above. Eyebrows, inspect the eyebrows, noting for their fullness, hair distribution, and any scaliness, scaliness of the underlying skin. For the eyelids, note the position of the lids in relation to the eyeballs. Inspect for the following, width of the palpebral fissures, edema of the lids, color of the lids, lesions, condition and directions of the eyelashes, adequacy of eyelid closure, and look for this especially when the eyes are usually prominent when there is facial paralysis or when the patient is unconscious. And check for the lacrimal apparatus. Briefly inspect the regions of the lacrimal gland and lacrimal sac for swelling. Checking for the conjunctiva and the sclera. Ask the patient to look up as you depress both lower lids with your thumbs, exposing the sclera and conjunctiva. Inspect the sclera and palpebral conjunctiva for color. Note the vascular pattern against the white scleral background. Look for any nodules or swelling. If you need a fuller view of the eye, 
rest your thumb and finger on the bones of the cheek and brow, respectively, and spread the lids, as you can see in the picture. Ask the patient to look each side and down. This technique gives you a good view of the sclera and the bulbar conjunctiva, but not of its palpebral conjunctiva of the upper lid. For this, you need to invert the lid. Now, checking for the cornea and lens. With oblique lighting, inspect the cornea of each eye for opacities. Note any opacities in the lens that may be visible through the pupil. For the iris, the marking should be clearly defined. With your light shining directly from the temporal side, look for a crescentic shadow on the medial side of the iris. Because the iris is normally fairly flat and forms a relatively open angle with cornea. This lighting casts no shadow. So if there is shadow, then there is a, an anomaly or a disease. For the pupils, in a dim light, inspect the size and shape and symmetry of both pupils. Measure the pupils with the card showing black circles of varying sizes shown below and test the light reaction. Note if the pupils are large, greater than 5 mm or small, less than 3 mm or unequal. The light reaction in dim light, test the pupillary reaction to light. Ask the patient to look into the distance and shine a bright light obliquely into each pupil in turn. Both the distant gaze and ob the oblique lighting help to prevent a near reaction. Then look for the direct, direct reaction, pillary constriction in the same eye, as you can see in the picture. Then consensual reaction, pupillary constriction in the opposite eye. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Now we check for the near reaction. If the reaction to light is impaired or questionable, test the near reaction in both dim and normal light. Testing one eye at a time makes it easier to concentrate on papillary responses without the distraction of the extraocular movements. Hold your finger or pencil about 10 cm from the patient's eye. Ask the patient to look alternately at it into the distance directly behind it. Watch the papillary constriction with near effort and convergence of the eyes. The third component of the near reaction, accommodation of the lens that brings the near object into focus, is not visible. For the extraocular muscles, standing about two feet directly in front of the patient, shine a light into the patient's eyes and ask the patient to look at it. Inspect the light reflection in the corneas. They should be visible slightly nasal to the center of the pupils. To test for the six extraocular movements, ask the patient to follow your finger or pencil as you sweep through the six cardinal directions of gaze. Making a wide H in the air, lead the patient's gaze. Number one, to the patient's extreme right, followed by to the right and upward, and down on the right, then without pausing in the middle to the extreme left, to the left and upward and down on the left. Pause during upward and lateral gaze to detect nystagmus. These are the steps in using ophthalmoscope. First, darken the room, switch on the ophthalmoscope light, and turn the lens disc until you see the large round beam of white light. Shine the light on the back of your hand to check the type of light, its desired brightness, and the electrical charge of the ophthalmoscope. Some clinicians like to use the large round beam for large pupils and the small round beam for small pupils. The other beams are rarely helpful. The slit-like beam is sometimes used to assess elevations or concavities in the retina and the green or red free beam to detect small red lesions and the grid to make measurements. Ignore the last three lights and practice with the large or small round white beam. Turn the lens disc to the zero diopter. A diopter is a unit that measures the power of a lens to converge or diverge light. At this diopter, the lens neither converges 
nor diverges light. Keep your finger on the edge of the lens disc so you can turn the disc to focus the lens when you examine the fundus. Hold the ophthalmoscope in your right hand and use your right eye to examine the patient's right, right eye. Hold it in your left hand and use your left eye to examine the patient's left eye. This keeps you from bumping the patient's nose and gives you more mobility and closer range for visualizing the fundus. With practice, you will become accustomed to using your non-dominant eye. Hold the ophthalmoscope firmly, braced against the medial aspect of your bony orbit, bony orbit with the handle tilted laterally at about a 20 degree slant from the vertical. Check to make sure you can see clearly through the aperture. Instruct the patient to look slightly up and over your shoulder at a point directly ahead on the wall. Place yourself about 15 inches away from the patient at an angle, 15 degree lateral to the patient's line of vision. Shine the light beam on the pupil and look for the orange glow in the pupil, the red reflex. Note any opacities interrupting the red reflex. Now place the thumb of your other hand across the patient's eyebrow, which steadies your examining hand, keeping the light beam focused on the red reflex. Move in the Move in with the ophthalmoscope on the 15-degree angle toward the pupil until you are very close to it, almost touching the patient's eyelashes and thumb of your other hand. Now we go on to the ears. The techniques and examination, the oracle. Inspect the oracle and the surrounding tissue for deformities, lumps, or skin lesions. If ear pain, discharge, or inflammation is present, move the oracle up and down Press the tragus and press firmly just behind the ear. So in checking for the ear canal and drums, straighten the ear canal to insert the otoscope. That is why it is very important for you to have an otoscope. Brace your hand and gently insert the speculum. Insert the speculum at a slight downward angle to be able to view the structures inside. Inspect the ear canal, noting any discharge, foreign bodies, redness of the skin, or swelling. Serumen, which varies in color and consistency from yellow and flaky to brown and sticky or even to dark and hard, may wholly or partly obscure your view. In my experience as a student and as I had rotated in my ENT during my family medicine um, residency training, uh, it was weird to really see serumen. Ang description ko pa before is, bakit may parang crayola sa, sa loob ng ear? So they can really vary in color. Inspect the eardrum, noting its color and contour. The cone of light, usually easy to see, helps to orient you. Identify the handle of the malleus, noting its position, and inspect the short process of the malleus. Gently move the speculum so that you can see as much as, the, as of the drum as possible, including the pars flaxida, Superiorly and the margins of the pars tensa, look for the, any perforations. The anterior and inferior margins of the drum may be obscured by curving the wall of the ear canal. Testing for the auditory acuity using whispered voice test. So the, to begin screening, ask the patient, do you feel you have a hearing loss or difficulty hearing? If the patient reports hearing loss, proceed to the whispered voice test. The whispered voice test is a reliable screening test for hearing loss if the examiner uses a standard method of testing and exhales before whispering. So in performing the whisper test, check the patient's response to your whispered voice one ear at a time. Mark, mask the hearing in the other ear by having the patient place a finger on the ear canal and gently move it rapidly up and down. Stand to the side of the patient at a consistent distance best for you, about one to two feet away from the ear being tested and out of the vision of the patient's line of vision. Whisper a combination of three letters and numbers very softly and ask the patient to repeat the, what the, the words heard. So normal findings, the patient should hear softly whispered words in each ear at that distance of about 1 to 2 feet, responding correctly more than 50% of the time. 
Then testing for conductive versus neurosensory hearing loss using the tuning fork test. For patients failing with, whisper, with the whispered voice test, the Weber and Rhine fork test may help determine if the hearing loss is conductive or sensory neural in origin. To, to conduct this test, make sure the room is quiet and use a tuning fork of 512 hertz. Those, these frequencies fall within the range of a conversational speech, namely 500 to 3,000 hertz and between 45 and 60 decibels. Set the fork into light vibration by briskly stroking it between the thumb and index finger or by tapping it on your forearm just in front of your elbow. Test for lateralization or Weber test. Place the base of the lightly vibrating tuning fork firmly on top of the patient's head or on the mid forehead. Ask where the patient hears the sound, on one side or both sides. Normally, the vibration is heard in the midline or equally in both ears. If nothing is heard, try again pressing the fork more firmly on the head. Restrict this test to patients with unilateral hearing loss since patients with normal hearing may lateralize and patients with bilateral conductive or sensory neural deficits will not lateralize. Now comparing your air conduction and bone conduction, Ryan test place the base of a lightly vibrating tuning fork on the mastoid bone behind the ear and level with the canal. So when the patient can no longer hear the sound, quickly place the fork close to the ear canal and ask if the patient hears a vibration. Here, the U of the fork should face forward, which maximizes sound transmission for the patient. Normally, the sound is heard longer through, ear, through air than through the bone. In conductive hearing loss, sound is heard through bone as long as or longer than it is through air. In sensory neural hearing loss, sound is heard longer through air than bone. Techniques of examination in inspecting the anterior and inferior surfaces of the nose. Now, gentle pressure on the tip of the nose with your thumb usually widens the nostrils. Use a pen light or otoscope light to obtain a partial view of each nasal vestibule. If the nasal vestibule tip is tender, be gentle and manipulate the nose as little as possible. Note any asymmetry or deformity of the nose. Test for nasal obstruction if indicated by pressing on each ala nasi in turn and asking the patient to breathe in. Inspect the inside of the nariz with an otoscope and the largest available ear speculum. Tilt the patient's head back a bit and insert the speculum gently into the vestibule of each nostril, avoiding contact with the sensitive nasal septum. Hold the otoscope handle to one side to avoid patient's chin and improve your mobility. By directing the speculum posteriorly, then upward in small steps, Try to see the inferior and middle turbinates, the, na the nasal septum, and the narrow nasal passage between them. Some asymmetry of the two sides is normal. Other techniques, nasal mucosa that covers the septum and turbinates, noting its color and any swelling, nasal septum for position and integrity, then palpate the frontal and maxillary sinuses. So as you can see in this picture, you palpate the frontal sinuses and palpate the maxillary sinuses. For the lips, observe their color and moisture and note any lumps, ulcers, cracking, or scaliness. For the oral mucosa, look into the patient's mouth and with a good light and the help of a tongue blade, inspect the oral mucosa for color, ulcer, white patches, and nodules. For the gums and teeth, note the color of the gums, which are normally pink. Brown patches may be present, especially but not exclusively in dark-skinned individuals. Inspect the gum margins and the interdental papillae for swelling or ulceration. Inspect the teeth. Are any of them missing, discolored, misshapen, or abnormally positioned? 
To assess the tooth, jaw, or facial pain, palpate the teeth for looseness and the gums with your glove, thumb, and index finger. Then check for the roof of the mouth. Inspect the color and architecture of the hard palate. The tongue and the floor of the mouth ask the patient to put out his or her tongue. Inspect it for symmetry. A test of the hypoglossal nerve or the cranial nerve 12, note the color and texture of the dorsum of the tongue. As you can see in the picture, if there is deviation, then there is a problem in your hypoglossal nerve. The pharynx. With the patient's mouth open, but the tongue not protruded, ask the patient to, to say ah or yawn. This action helps you see the posterior pharynx well. You can also ask the patient to open back of your throat, since many adults have learned to inspect their own posterior pharynx while looking in the mirror. Alternatively, you can press a tongue blade firmly down on the midpoint of the arched tongue back far enough to visualize the pharynx, but not so far that you can cause gagging. Simultaneously, ask for an ah or a yawn, then note the rise of the soft palate, a test of the vagal nerve or the cranial nerve 10. As you can see in the picture, this is a cranial nerve 10 paralysis. Then inspect the soft palate, anterior and posterior pillars, obula, tonsils, and pharynx. Note their color and symmetry and look for exudate, swelling, ulceration, or tonsillar enlargement. If possible, palpate any suspicious area of induration or tenderness. Tonsil subcrypts or deep enfoldings of squamous epithelium where whitish spots of normal exfoliating epithelium may sometimes be seen, or ang tinatawag nila na tonsil stones. Now we go to the neck. You must study your anatomy of the different nodes of the neck. Now we have the lymph nodes. Palpate the lymph nodes using the pads of your index and middle finger, press gently, moving the skin over the underlying tissues in each area. The patient should be relaxed, with the neck flex slightly forward, if needed, turn slightly toward the side being examined. You can usually examine both sides at once, noting the presence of lip nodes as well as asymmetry. For the submental node, however, it is helpful to feel with one hand while bracing the top of the head with the other. So as you can see, these are the different lymph node locations of our head, of our neck. Note the lymph node sizes, shape, delimitation, discrete or matted together, mobility, consistency, and any tenderness. Is it small, mobile, discrete, non-tender node, sometimes termed shoddy, are frequently found in normal people. Describe enlarged nodes in two dimensions, the maximal length and width, for example, 1 cm by 2 cm. Also note any overlying skin changes such as erythema, Injuration, drainage, or breakdown. Enlarged or tender nodes, if unexplained, call for an examination of the regions they drain and careful assessment of lymph nodes in other regions to identify regional from generalized lymph adenopathy. Now we go to the trachea and the thyroid gland. To orient yourself of the neck, identify the thyroid and the cricoid cartilages and the trachea below them. Inspect the trachea for any deviation from its usual midline position. Then palpate for any deviation. Place your fingers along one side of the trachea and note the space between, the sterno between it and the sternocleidomastoid. Compare it with other side. The spaces should be symmetric. Auscultate breath sounds over the trachea. This allows subtle counting of the respiratory rate and establishes a point of reference when assessing upper versus lower airway causes of shortness of breath. When assessing shortness of breath, always remember to listen over the trachea for strider for upper airway etiologies in addition to examining the lungs. Inspect the neck for the thyroid gland. Tip the patient's head slightly back using tangential light lighting directed toward from the tip of the patient's chin. Inspect the region below the cricord cartilage to identify contours of the gland. The shadowed lower border of the thyroid glands shown here is outlined by arrows. I do not have a picture. Observe the patient swallowing. Ask the patient to sip some water and to extend the neck again and swallow. Watch for upward movement of the thyroid gland, noting its contour and symmetry. 
the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid cartilage, and the thyroid gland all rise with swallowing and then fall to the resting positions. So here are the steps for palpating the thyroid gland in a posterior approach. Ask the patient to flex the neck slightly forward to relax the sternocleidomastoid muscles. Place the fingers of both hands on the patient's neck so that your index finger are just below the cricoid cartilage. Ask the patient to sip and swallow water as before. Feel for the thyroid ismus rising up and your finger pads. It is often but not always palpable. Displace the trachea to the right with the fingers of the left hand. With the right hand fingers, palpate laterally for the right lobe of the thyroid and the space between the displaced trachea and the relaxed sternocleidomastoid. From the lat find the lateral margin in a similar fashion, examine the left lobe. The lobes are somewhat harder to feel than the isthmus, so practice is needed. The anterior surface of the lateral lobe is approximately the size of the distal phalanx of the thumb and feels somewhat rubbery. Note the size, shape, and consistency. Is it soft, firm, or hard? of the gland and identify any nodules or tenderness. In general, benign or colloid nodules tend to be more uniform, ovoid structures, and are not fixed to surrounding tissues. If the thyroid gland is enlarged, listen over the lateral lobes with a stethoscope to detect a brewy, a sound similar to a cardiac murmur, but not of cardiac origin. So this is an example of our placement position in examining a, our thyroid gland in pos posterior position. Now go to the carotid arteries in the jugular veins. Therefore, a detailed examination of the neck vessels until the cardiovascular examination. When the patient is supine with the head elevated to 30 degree angle. For jugular venous distension, visible with patient in the sitting position, assess the heart and lungs promptly. Also be alert to, usually, to the unusually prominent arterial pulse, pulsations. Now we record your findings for the HENT examination. So this is an example for the head. The skull is normocephalic, atraumatic, frontal balding, eyes, visual acuity of 20 over 100 bilaterally, sclery, white, conjunctiva injected, pupils constrict from three to two millimeters, equally round and reactive to light and accommodation, disc margins sharp, no hemorrhages, hemorrhages or exudates, Arteriolar to venous ratio to is to four, no AV nicking. Ears, acuity diminished to whispered voice, intact to spoken voice. TMs clear, nose, mucosa swollen with erythema and clear drainage. Septum midline, tender over maxillary sinuses. Throat, oral mucosa pink, dental caries in lower molars, pharynx, erythematous, no exudates. For the neck, trachea midline, neck supple, Thyroid ismus midline, lobes palpable but not enlarged. Lymph nodes, submandibular and your cervical lymph nodes, tender, one by one centimeter, rubbery and mobile. No posterior cervical, epitrochlear, axillary, or inguinal lymphadenopathy. So, this finding suggests myopia and mild arteriolar narrowing as well as upper respiratory res tract infection. So, this is just an example in your uh, activity or in I, kapag mag-groupings na tayo, you will be given uh, certain activities by your proctors. So, um, and also, I would be sending you videos of the, P, of the physical examination of the head and neck in separate of this video. So, that's all. Um, God bless everyone.